Hey guys, well thank you for <laughs> being here with us for some uh, kind of live interactive thoughts about evangelism uh, that I, I think both of these men will serve us very well. The, the intention of this time was to provide kind of some Q&A elements for them, so I'm going to ask them some questions along the way and let them just elaborate some some ideas and perspectives that they have on this topic, but also want to make room for your questions that, that you want to interact and ask. So along the way, if you hear something or if you've heard something so far, if you've just come here with questions from life about how to do evangelism, you want to ask some questions and get some, some good answers from these guys, um, then please write, write that down and be prepared when we say it's time for you guys to shoot some Q&A at us. Um, all right, you've already met Jim, and if you're from New Orleans, you know who Frank is. If you're not from New Orleans, Frank Loria is one of the elders in New Orleans, and uh, he leads our Alpha program, and he leads that program because he would be our resident evangelist, that God is just using him to equip us to do evangelism, but he, he he's like Jim, yeah, I'm very much appreciated, man. Um, and then you these, these guys. Fan club. Yeah. You brought your fan club. With no, you just paid them. He paid them before yeah. the meeting. Um, all right, here's how I want to start this off. Because one of the things that I want us to hear from these men is everyday examples that are accessible for us. Uh, evangelism can be, I think many Christians would say, one of the harder things that we do. And yet these guys are going to have examples that are accessible. They're examples of relating to people that ended up having an impact or created an opportunity for the gospel and they've trusted that that is going to produce an impact at some point later in life. So here's how I want to start this off. I want to ask Frank to uh, read a couple of letters. This, this is a sovereign setup that God arranged for this, the timing of these letters to come when they did in the last couple of weeks and for this conference to be happening right now and for Frank to be participating in it as one of the guys speaking. So. Um, he will give you the, the reference for these, why these letters are meaningful and what they are. Uh, I had the, um, I, I graduated from uh, LSU in the summer of 1978 uh, without a job and uh, got married three weeks later. And um, I was going to this little funky Assembly of God church. It was an X-rated movie theater that had become a church. Um, <laughs> It was a church on Sundays, and um, <laughs> and uh, so while we were there, one of the um, it was a very small church, and uh, uh, we would take prayer requests at the end. And uh, one of the guys was a coach and a teacher at a small uh, high school uh, in the suburbs of New Orleans, and he said, "You know, we're really praying for a, a science teacher and a, and a and a coach." Well, I didn't listen to the science teacher part, but the coach part, you had me on that. So I told him about it, talked to him about it, interviewed, and they were desperate. They were truly <laughs> desperate. Uh, and uh, they hired me, and I am convinced the students knew more about the science I was teaching them than, than I knew. And actually, during those, during those classes, I would even somehow bring them the gospel. So in the middle of a science class, I could just break off into teaching something out of the Gospels. It was crazy. And then I asked the school if they would allow me to do a Bible study in the gym. And they said, sure. And so started having a Bible study in the gym. And five kids, ten kids, fifteen kids, every day, kids would come into the gym and they would listen to the Gospel. And... Uh, the school ended up closing uh, the next year. Ran out of money, ended up closing, and, uh, and the kids were dispersed. And I got another job in the recruiting world that I have been in since 1979. And, uh, but I've had the opportunity to stay in touch with some of those kids and watch them grow up, and it's been a lot of fun as well. So that was about 40 years ago. Well, in early December, I got a postcard, or a, a little thank you card out of nowhere. Had no, had no um, return address, 
And I'd just like to read it to you, if I can, without crying. It's it says, uh, Dear Frank, I can do that without my glasses. You may not remember me, but I'm Patty Bracado Bergeron. I was one of your students at Kehoe. Kehoe was the name of the school. My sister Mary was there also, along with a few of my brothers at one time. Anyways, I don't know why she added an S to anyways. I'm writing to tell you, you've been the most influential person in my life. Because of you, I became a Christian. And because of you, my children all know the Lord. That's amazing. Yesterday I visited a nursing home. While I was there, we sang praise and worship songs. I asked the Lord, how did I get here? Just then, the song, I'll Fly Away, came on. <laughs> I then realized it all started at that tiny church you and Annette took a bunch of teenagers to. I surrendered my life to the Lord during that song in a little old building in New Orleans. Who knew that night would have forever changed me? I'm not on Facebook, so I asked one of my daughters to find you. She goes to Colorado Christian University in Lakewood, Colorado. See, Frank, you've touched generations. That's amazing. Thank you for being so brave. You were so young, too. <laughs> All is well with me. I've been married 35 years, and we have six children and five grandchildren. Hug Annette for me. Much love, Patty. That's amazing. Then two weeks later, comes another card from her sister, Mary. Dear Frank and Annette, my sister Patty and I were talking about how deep the seeds you planted in our hearts and the great harvest that has come from them. I know you received a card from her as well. My husband of 35 years and I are living in Colorado. We attend a Bible church, have attended one for the past 18 years, and have raised our two sons up in the Word. Our oldest attends Wheaton College in Illinois, and our youngest is at Colorado State University. They both love the Lord. I met my husband in, at Campus Crusade 36 years ago at LSU. So anyway, my boys know the names Frank and Annette very well. I'm an art teacher, and I believe God is using that to be the light and spread his word. God bless you both. I know how deep seeds can grow. And I believe in God's perfect time they will grow into strong oaks. Love, Mary. That's amazing. So, what can I say more than that? Yeah. Um, All right, now the rest of the story. <laughs> In 1978, I was attending a little private school. <laughs> My dad took me out of one private school, sent me to Rummel High School in New Orleans, knowing that that little private school wasn't going to last, it was going to run out of money. I begged for him to send me back to this other little private school where I had all kinds of friends and girl that I was interested in, lots of motivation to be in this other school, and somehow in God's sovereign purposes, he convinced my very responsible father to make a very irresponsible decision, and he sent me back to this school. So in 1978, I walked back onto the campus of this school I grew up in, small private school in October, and I'm looking for this particular girl. She just happens to be the girl who sent the first letter to him that he just read. She's not hanging around at lunchtime. She's in a Bible study. I'm like, a what? Yeah, she, she goes to this Bible study that one of the coaches does during the lunch hour. I wasn't interested in the Bible, but I was interested in her, and if she's there, I'll go. <laughs> so I come walking in to this Bible study. There's six or eight kids sitting in there listening to Frank ask questions about the Bible, and I sit down at the bottom of the bleachers in the gym, and something that he said just 
my eyes and my curiosity just was opened. I had never thought about that that way. And so shortly after that, I found a Bible, started reading a Bible in October of 1978. Is some of this stuff saying, is this true? I've never heard some of this. Read a Bible for a few months in February of, of 1979. Uh, Frank would now have been my coach. I played football and basketball for him in the school. Invites me and these other guys at this lunchtime Bible study to go to church. There's a, a movie, I think, that was being shown at, at this former X-rated theater. <laughs> uh, it was not an X-rated movie. It was not a good movie. and was not a theologically sound movie either. But it was, it was an opportunity for us to hear the gospel. And, uh, and I responded to the gospel in February of 1979 and was saved. And what I, what, one, I just wanted, I wanted to, to highlight something about this story uh, before Frank got these letters in the mail. Because, you know, here, here's a reality that you don't know anything about this story. Mm -hmm. And it's likely it could never have even come to your attention. But uh, I've, I've been serving a church in Lakeview uh, since 1993 as a pastor. I've been the senior pastor there since 1997. I became a part of Sovereign Grace. And many of you would only know me because I'm a part of Sovereign Grace. And I come visit your churches as a regional leader. But what you wouldn't have known about that story was that story got started by mm -hmm. a guy who just asked, could I do a Bible study at lunchtime? Mm -hmm. And if kids want to come, great. If they don't want to come, that's up to them. But would you let me do that? And it was just a guy who took the initiative to find an opportunity to tell somebody about Christ. Mm -hmm. And to hear, you know, the first girl was a girl I was chasing. The second girl was my date to my, high, my senior prom, uh, Mary. <laughs> um, to hear what God has done in their lives for the rest of their lives. I haven't been in touch with them since high school. Um, to see my own story that started in such a simple place with such a simple act of sharing the gospel. See, that is evangelism in the everyday. Mm -hmm. There's nothing profound. He, says he wasn't a conference speaker. He wasn't asked to do something amazing. He just, could I find a way to talk to kids about the gospel? Mm -hmm. And he did. And a number of us in that little group are saved. Uh, mm -hmm. There's guys in our church. There's family members that come from connections to that little Bible study. People that have gotten saved in other parts of the country who look back to a little short period of months where a Bible study was available during lunchtime. So what I, I want us to hear from these guys is uh, that, that opportunity awaits all of us as we just find places in the everyday spaces of our lives to bring the gospel into people's lives. You just have no idea mm -hmm. what story God's about to yeah, write into good. their lives. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, bro, thank you awesome. for awesome. <laughs> those deep, deep lunch meetings. <laughs> they were not deep lunch meetings, but they were obviously unbelievably meaningful. Yeah. Um, so let me let me fire a question at you guys. So let me can I just tell my story yeah. real quick? Yes, Here's please. another unspectacular story, and that was you know it's just amazing. Um, just to encourage you guys, so I I grew up um, good Irish Catholic family. We moved from the Catholic Church, offended the Catholic Church, into Episcopal Church. So most of my growing up was Episcopalian. Um, I have a twin brother. Did I mention that I have an identical twin brother? And uh, you know we were just whatever typical crazy sports, Italians, girls, you know, just doing whatever we wanted to do, right? So we had a friend in chemistry class, um, and it was interesting because his friend, his name was Alvaro Rivera, his dad was from Colombia, his mom was from the U.S. He was kind of on the nerdier side, but he was kind of friends with us, so there are some things that he would do with us, but there are other things he wouldn't, like he wouldn't go to parties and do that, so he had drawn lines, but we didn't know he was a Christian, but he was a Christian. Um, and one day in chemistry class, he said to my brother and me, he said, um, so you guys, do you guys think you're good enough to go to heaven? And we said, yeah. I mean, obviously, just look at us. Of course we're good enough. <laughs> and, um, and so he said, well, the Bible says it's impossible to be good enough to get to heaven. 
And my brother and I were both Irish, so we like to argue even if we have no idea what we're talking about. So we were just like, uh, uh, nah. A lot of yah yahs and nah ahs were ensuing, and he kept kind. And we're like, uh, yeah, well, yeah, we did had no arguments for him. So through this simple conversation, went back to my house, our home, and said, Mom, do we have a Bible anywhere? And she had this big, huge, white Catholic wedding Bible. Does anybody know it? It had like a framed picture of Jesus on it. Has anybody ever seen one of these? So it was up on the shelf, and we pulled this thing down. It was like, poof, this mushroom cloud of dust, like, bomb comes up, and we let, and I open, like, you know, there's a $2 bill, there's a pressed fern, there's a pressed flower. It's like, what is this, some kind of, like, a, a museum or something in this? So, somehow, I don't know how we did this, but we found John 3.16. And so we came back the next day to my friend Alvaro with our chest puffed out, saying, hey, listen, um, we were reading in the book of Johnny, and it says, if you believe, you're in. So we believe we're in, so there, take that! And he goes, he had enough, he said, well, in James chapter 2, it, it also says that even the demons believe in God and shudder. And we're like, <laughs> Who is this kid? What is he, a priest or something? So that began all these conversations and these really arguments. And he gave us a Bible. My brother and I would fight over this Bible. And I started to read it to try to disprove him. And God, through that, we would have conversations with his mom. They were part of the Baptist church. And she would answer our questions. And then I went away to college, and I would read the Bible every single night. Uh, my freshman year, I'd read from midnight to one in the morning. And then the second semester, uh, my classes were a little later. I'd read from one in the morning to two in the morning. So I read the whole Bible in like two and a half months. While I was partying, while I was doing all these things, but I was reading the Bible, and God used that to save my life. And this is what I also often wonder. I wonder, we were friends with Alvaro for a while, for maybe like a couple years, a year and a half, two years. What made him say something? What, why all of a sudden did he start this conversation with us? Was he at a seminar, a retreat like this? Did his pastor do a message and challenge his congregation to speak up for the gospel? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, God used that to save me, and he saved my brother, who's also a pastor in Sovereign Grace. And God has used us to reach many people, just to declare the gospel. You don't know what just to... And, and this is the thing. Alvaro would have left the conversation thinking this. Boy, that was a disaster. Oh my goodness, those guys, kids are... are those twins, all they do is... Are, they have no idea what they're talking about. Right? He could have... Evalu his evaluation of those... Uh, probably the first couple months of conversation was, this is going nowhere. These guys are so arrogant and pig-headed. I can't get anything through to these guys. But the Lord used it. You never know. So I love what Frank, you never know. Even just that conversation. Do you guys think you're going to go to heaven? And God can use it. So never underestimate what God can do, even if it seems like it didn't go well. You may have planted a seed that God's going to water and bring forth great fruit. You guys, I, I think, you know, Jim, I don't know you, obviously. I know Frank for many years. I don't know the details of what your day-to-day -day looks like. Um, but I think anybody who does know you would say the same thing that those who know Frank would say. Uh, evangelism characterizes your life. It, it, is, it is a feature on the landscape of who you are. If somebody is engaging you, they're going to bump into that. How, how did that take shape? How did that become mm -hmm. something that was always within arm's reach? Something that you have a passion about, mm -hmm. something that has shaped you and that you have pursued the way you have. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, that's like asking me, um, how did you become white? Um, <laughs> I mean, I can just remember from the day after surrendering my life to Christ, I'm talking to people about Jesus. And it's like, you're not, you're not doing that? You're a Christian and you're not doing that? So it, I don't mean to make fun of the question. It's just, look, I, I chicken out of sharing the gospel with people more than I power in. I, I'm confident of that. 
Um, I'm sure my batting average is probably something like 182 or something like that in, in triple A, maybe single A ball. Um, but I would just, a couple of things happened. One was, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm so grateful somebody told me about Jesus. Shouldn't I tell somebody about Jesus? And isn't it awesome to tell somebody else about mm -hmm. Jesus? And then I think one of the things maybe I heard from the Lord, it's very clear now, is that wherever you are, Frank Loria, you represent me. Mm -hmm. And I've put you where I've put you preeminently to declare how good I am and how much people need the gospel just like I needed the gospel. Um, and so... I, I, there's an intentionality. I, I, I know that God has placed in me to believe that if I am here with this person right now, mm -hmm. there's a purpose for this more than just business. Um, it may not show up right away. It may be in our 10th meeting together, our fourth meeting together. It may be 20 years later. Um, but there's that, there's that thinking about it. If I'm getting in a cab, particularly if I'm getting in a cab in New York, I know one thing, I can, I can put every dollar, that cab driver is a Muslim. I'm confident of that. So it's like, how easy is this to get into a conversation with a Muslim cab driver? So, and I'm not going to go into all the ways in which you have a conversation with a Muslim cab driver. Um, it's not, <laughs> um, but I, I can't answer that question, Keith, in any kind of, you know, the training I received as a result of coming to Christ. I mean, this, it's just like breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's my delight and it's my joy. Um, and, but that's the thing, like you just said, if somebody says, well, you know, there's no question, you're an evangelist and all this, I'm going, I am. I just thought I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't really even try to identify myself. If Jesus lives in me, he was a pretty good evangelist. And if for me to live as Christ, then shouldn't evangelism happen in some form or fashion? Maybe not the way Keith, or maybe Jim, or, or maybe somebody else, or Billy Graham. But there should be that, that heart that's coming mm -hmm. forward. So I... I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, maybe Jim does. Let's ask Jim. <laughs> uh, Anybody else want to volunteer to be on the panel who's got some answers? <laughs> yeah, let me, I, I think it's a great question. I want to, let me say something a little bit on kind of the opposite side of what Frank is, is saying, because I think that um, evangelism is hard for most people. It's not natural. It's the, it's the hardest area of the Christian life. It's the scariest area of the Christian life. It's the only area that can really get you persecuted and killed. Most other things that we do as Christians are not going to be scary. So there's pain involved. There's a pain line, a threshold that you have to cross. And there's a difference. I, I want to kind of free you up a little bit here. There's a difference between the calling that everyone has to, to reach out with the gospel. I couldn't agree with Frank more. If you're a follower of Christ... Uh, you're called by God to help other people become followers of Christ. There's no such thing as someone who's following Christ not helping someone else to become a follower of Christ. Um, so we're call, called to do evangelism. That's different than an evangelist. An evangelist is somebody like Frank, like me, that's not only sharing the gospel, but also equipping others to share the gospel. That's what Keith quoted in Ephesians 4. It's an equipping. So we're, we're not just called to reach out to people. We're called to... Equip others to reach out to people. Not all of you are called to do that. Um, and, and one of the things about evangelists is that they're a little crazy. Like there, there's a fine line between evangelism and, and insanity. You know what I mean? Like there's a, if you think about it, like you have these antennas like that are picking up signals from other people and trying to get vibes. Evangelists have them mainly snapped off or they're very small, which allows them to kind of like plow through and not mind making people feel uncomfortable on those kind of things. But it's, it's a fine line. If it's too far, you're, you're kind of insane a little bit. So, so Frank and I are probably a little more like that. Not everyone's like that. You know, you might have big antennas. You're very aware of what other people are thinking, how they're feeling. Evangelism is going to be different for every single one of us. And it's got to fit who you are, your gifts, 
your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses, your style. You don't have to do it like me. I, I love talking to people. I'm super outgoing. I could talk to a tree if I needed to. I'm really, can, that's part of who I am. So I need to be out talking to people where I go. I do that pretty easily, pretty naturally. That may be very difficult for you. That's okay. But you've got to figure out, how am I going to do this? What does that look like for me? with who I am, my gifts, my abilities, strengths, and weaknesses. It does not have to look, and that's the problem. A lot of times you think, okay, is this, we're all going to go door to door now, we have to do direct evangelism, we have to use tracks, but no. You have to figure out, how am I going to reach the people that God's placed in my life? And use who you are to do that. All right, well, speaking for the, the rest of us in the room, except for, you know, I know a few people that are in the room would, would seem to press Past the discomfort level. Um, why, why is this so hard? What are we bumping into when we go to do evangelism that makes wheels lock up and something of an aversion rise up in our hearts? What is it that we're going to have to face this reality? We're going to have to get past yeah. that. And I'm going to talk about that tomorrow a good deal in the, in the message in Acts. It's fear. It's just fear. Um, we just care about what people think, right? It's just fear. Um, there is, I like how uh, this author Rico Tice talks about this in a book called Honest Evangelism. There's a pain line in evangelism, okay? So years ago, another guy named Tom Rainier did a survey, and he found that only 5% um, of Americans are openly hostile to Christianity. 5% are really openly hostile, okay? Now, it feels a lot bigger than that, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel like, uh, I would have said, 50% of Americans are openly hostile. He did an extensive survey, but our fears say, make that much bigger, right? So it's like, it feels like everyone, every librarian, they are openly <laughs> hostile to Christianity. And the monster grows in our minds. The fear can grow. So, so, what happens is that let's say that you're out sharing the gospel, you're in a seminar like this, or you're here on a weekend, you just like, okay, that does it. I, you know, you kind of work yourself up, you know, you drink a monster energy drink, you do some jumping jacks, I'm going to share the gospel, you pump yourself up, you go and you share the gospel. Well, in this scenario, you share with people and some people are open and then you finally hit that openly hostile person, right? You hit somebody like, like my brother and me, doesn't go well, it's an argument, it ends well. And then this is what we think. So you experience some pain, pushback, persecution. And then this is what we think. I, I should have never done that. That didn't go very well. Why, why am I doing this? Thinking that for somebody like Frank or me that all those conversations go well. Well, no, it's not. It's the, there's going to be opposition to this message. What has encouraged me the most in evangelism is um, the fact that what we're called to do is not convert people. That's only, only God can save and convert and regenerate. We're simply called to share a message. And so in some ways evangelism is fail-proof. So let's, our job is just to share the gospel. We cannot control the results, the reaction, any of that, right? It's getting a message out. We believe that. In Romans 1.16, the power of God is in that message. Is the power of the gospel is in declaring and proclaiming that message, right? So we get that message out. Well, there's only three things that can happen, right? One, you planted a seed. Just like Frank planted all those seeds, or we're planting a seed. You don't, God can use that. It's a, that's a good thing, right? Um... Two, they could fall on their knees and get saved and give their lives to Christ. That's a great thing. That's a good thing, right? Or three, they can reject you and persecute you. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when men persecute you, revile you, and say all kinds of falsehood against you. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. If you believe in the gospel and love Jesus enough to share it and you get persecuted, Jesus says this, you're blessed. I am blessed. You are blessed. That person is blessing you. God is blessing you. Because great is your one. So in some ways, it's fail-proof. The only way you can fail is to not do anything. Anything other than that is a success. And I love that because what it's doing is it's lowering the bar, saying, okay, how, how can I 
build these relationships and, and try to get that message out in front of people. And if I do that, even if they reject me, that is not failure. Jesus says it's success. You're blessed if you do that. We think the opposite. Oh, what a failure. I knew I should, he, I should have never listened to that. Donnie, you guy, I just need to keep, I'm doing more damage than good here. And, and we just allow that fear to grind us down into submission where we don't say anything. And so I, I think that's what it is. But I don't know, Frank, what are, what are your thoughts? That's, that's good. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, a couple of scriptures that have, have really been pounding on me, particularly this year, but have through the years. Uh, one is Romans 1.16. Yeah. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to all who right. believe. Well, if I am ashamed of it, what does it say? I don't know what the power of God is. It's just as simple as that. Being ashamed means I don't know that it is the power of God, and I don't know the God of that power. And so, so much of it is what Keith's message was last night. If I'm going, I better be coming. And while I'm going, I better be coming. And while I'm coming, I better be going. And it, it's not, okay, I got it. Now, I'm, okay, let me, let me make sure I rehearse this perfectly well to get it right. Um, and so this 1 Corinthians 3 passage, I, I share this with my, I, I own a small business, um, and, and all of them have become Christians. If they want to keep their job, they become Christians. Uh, and, and so, um, not, not exactly, but uh, I've used the 1 Corinthians 3 passage in terms of sales. One plants, another waters. It's God who brings an increase. And so I've, I've said, don't sell them, just tell them. And tell them again, and again, and again, and as often as you can. So, I have a friend I went to high school with. Um, he, I wish he were here to tell the story. But he would probably throw F-bombs through the whole thing. But even though he's a believer today. Um, and the first time I talked to this man about Jesus... If you knew him, and Keith's gotten to know him, you know the re re uh, reaction I got. It's like, please, no. And then we got together again, and I probably met with that man, I don't know how many times, over the course of 25 years, I got a phone call at like 2 in the morning. It was right after Hurricane Gustav. And he basically said, I'm ready. I'm ready. I had another high school friend that I would just have lunch with and, and we'd get together and I'm, and I'm not thinking, oh, I blew that. I probably did think that I blew that, but, but they're hearing it anyway and they're still getting together with me for lunch anyway. And uh, some have gotten smart and they will not accept my lunch invitation. Um, but he was going through a difficult time in his life and having the chance to share with him. And he called me up after lunch we had together and he said, he used a curse word, and then he said, that blanken airplane analogy. Well, I gave him an analogy that had to do with, you don't fly the plane. God puts you in first class. He flies the plane. You just trust him to get you from here to there now. Stop flying the plane. And uh, so we had lunch a little bit later, and he's still walking with the Lord today. It's very exciting. And he just out of nowhere, we're having lunch. He says... You know what took me so long to give my life to Christ? And I'm, I'm ready for this. I can't wait. I mean, this is more fodder that I'm going to be able to use at an alpha course or whatever. He said, you. <laughs> oh, no. So I put my pen down. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I was afraid I was going to have to become like you. <laughs> and I... <laughs> And there was no way I was going to become like you. And I, oh my goodness. So you can't imagine the mixed emotions I had. But what, what a statement that was, though. That there's something that I was putting off, or something that he was receiving, maybe that I wasn't putting off, that made him think he had to be the religious Jesus freak zealot that he thought I was or that I was projecting that if you're going to be a Christian you have to go to church all the time you have to give away all your money and you got to do this and you got to go to uh, you know one-way ticket to Africa you got to do all these things um, thankfully God allowed him to break through that mm -hmm. 
but there's also just something about being whimsical with people. Just be yourself. Don't speak in the King James. Uh, use English. You know, one of the things we do in Alpha Training is to tell people, um, stop speaking Christian ease. What is, I got saved, born again, when I was in the world, as opposed to visiting Mars? I mean, what are you talking about? Um, Covered by the blood. Oh, hallelujah, brother. <laughs> that sounds attractive. Yeah. Well, I'll get some of that. All right, let me ask you guys a question. Um, all right, we're, we're all getting chapter one here. If we want to proceed further into the book, fear, everybody's cool. We're going to bump into fear. This is going to be an awkward thing. Uh, I think the next thing is we are living in common spaces with other people. All right, so I, I'm much more interested in hearing you guys comment on... Um, the, the familiar space world that we live in with people rather than teach us how to give out tracks on the beach. Right. All right. So that is a form of evangelism. But I, I mean, when we were thinking about actually when you introduced the Alpha Course at uh, back, way back when, that's mm -hmm. how I learned about it and brought it back to the church, talked to the leaders there. And I said, you know, this form of evangelism is going to work so much better for us than passing out tracts. And I actually stood mm -hmm. in front of the church. I said, can I see a quick show of hands? How many guys are in the church who came to Christ through a tract that was given to you on the street or in some public setting and not a hand went up anywhere? How many guys are in Christ and you're in this church because someone you know who was a friend or a family member led you to Christ? Hands up everywhere. Yeah, it's the settings of our lives, all right, so I'm going to throw out some settings. How can we use these? And you said something, maybe you both can elaborate on this, of, of taking what Jesus did. He took, he took natural conversations and introduced spiritual mm -hmm. components to them. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got settings that we're all living in, our family settings, our immediate family, our children, our wives. There are men here protect, perhaps that are walking with unbelieving spouses, mm -hmm. um, extended family. Your in-laws, uh, you know, how, 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 how do you relate to them? How do you build bridges into cousins and aunts and uncles that are in your life? Friends that you have known for years or you've walked with, co-workers in a setting that you're working in the environment with others and building and spending time with them. Uh, neighbors in your neighborhood. So th these are the common places of our lives. The challenge for us is we might feel like there's no bridge there for the gospel. I feel like to suddenly make this conversation go from what it usually sounds like to a gospel conversation, that just sounds weird, mm -hmm. guys. Come on. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. All right. How do you do that? Yeah, that's a good question. I if I go first. So, okay, yeah, that's a big question. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, one is we have to determine whether this is kind of a long-term relationship. So if this is somebody that I'm married to or this is family members or someone that I'm actually going to have to see every year at holiday meetings, you, you'd have a very different approach there or somebody that you work with. So this is over years and decades versus somebody that you meet on an airplane or somebody you see, those sort of things. Um, I think that the approach that we need is exactly what you're saying. It's friendship. We need to love people and take time to build close friendships with people. And that's what we don't do. And that's unbelievably hard for me. Given our lives, we do not, as you were talking about, carve out the space to build real friendships, to care about people, to love people. It's not as much about what we say. If you love someone enough, if you are loving and caring and kind, you can move a lot across the bridge if you have relationship. It's much harder to do that if you don't have relationship, especially today because the church has a terrible reputation and if you come up to somebody, it, 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 there's all kinds of stereotypes you have to undercut and try to get out from underneath to be able to bring that across the bridge. Well, that's why relational evangelism is so important, but, but we need to take time to build those relationships and to let people see that we love them. So are we doing that with our neighbors? Are we doing that with our coworkers? Are we taking our coworkers out to lunch or doing that once a week and building those relationships and getting to know them or with relatives or those sort of things? Those can be difficult situations. But what I found is this, is, is so much of it's on how can we, like, you know, I think, okay, well, here's the church, right? And, and I just think about you guys, okay? You guys know the gospel. 
You love Christ. You're hospitable. You're great at being with people, conversational. You All these tools, right? And then you have the world and this big circle of people in the world. And, and how can we get these two circles to intersect? Because if we can start rubbing shoulders and building friendships, stuff's going to happen. And you guys are more equipped than you know. However, this is what I would say, and, and, and I think this is very true when it comes to direct evangelism and, and those sort of things or using tracks. I have one that I use called How Good Are You? And I use this all the time. It's a very visual, good way to do this. Here's what I found. And this is how I think they work together. The most effective form of evangelism is friendship evangelism. Here's the problem. You'll start building friendships, maybe start going out with a coworker, reaching out to somebody, and then people say this, well, what do I say now? How do I, what do I say first? What do I say second? How do I get to the gospel? Those are the areas where we need training. And that's where something like a direct evangelism or a tool like this, which again, I view this as just like training wheels, as one way to share the gospel. What am I going to say first? What am I going to say second? What am I going to say third? People can be like, oh, that's terrible. It will never work. But you need to have a way, whether you use a track or not. And so what we do with more of a direct approach, like going out on the beach, is what that does. It does actually two things better than anything. It actually teaches you a way to share the gospel. It almost catechizes you. What do I say? What do I say next? But it also gives motivation. This is what I've found. When I'm out in public sharing the gospel... I just see how lost people are and it's amazing how people will get into conversations. And I have ways of doing that. It, affect, it changes me more than even them. And you know what that does? It gives me motivation to go and talk to my neighbor. So for instance, I'll just give you an example. I have a neighbor. He lives two doors down. I had been reaching out to him for when we first moved in for years. Did tons of things together. Okay, Had him over for dinner. Over there for dinner. We went to games. Went to basketball games. We played golf together. We uh, did stuff with our kids. We do Halloween every year with our kids. Like our boys and girls play together. So building this relationship. And I thought, you know what? This is long term. He's a neighbor. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to let him. So it was two and a half years later that we were on the golf course. He said, so, so how did you get into all this Christianity stuff? He knew I was a pastor. How did you get into this? I was like, yes. <laughs> well, sh was I supposed to just go from zero to two and a half years without sharing the gospel with anyone? No. So I, I would also try to reach out to people that I don't know and some be friendly. Try to add, hey, do you go to church in the area? And I might be working that while working this relational thing. Do you see? You can actually do both. You don't have to be like, I only do one or the other. I think both of them have a certain role, and I've found one really helps to motivate me in those relationships and think, I can't just be a friend. I have to try to get into conversations about the gospel. So thoughts on that, Frank? That's, that's, that's very exhaustive. Uh, there's no question the, the issue is relationships. There has to be trust. I have to look at that person as a person, not a project. He's not the next notch on my belt. Yeah. Uh, that I really care about him. And the way we can often show people that we care about them is not plowing them over with the gospel. They may know that you're a Christian already. Uh, maybe they don't, but I've found in conversations I'll have, whether they're business conversations or personal conversations with people that are not believers, I will ask them a million questions about themselves. Mm -hmm. A million questions about themselves before they ask me one question. I give them the chance to ask one question about me. Not that I'm opposed to that, but I want to know them and I want them to know that I want to know them. I want them to, you know, that's, that's interesting because, you know, when, when you said that, it made me think about this. Maybe that could be helpful. So I'm, I'm entering into their lives. I'm with, and I'm not doing, it's not a tactic. It's, I, I care for them. And so yeah, the more I get to know them, the more we interact, the more trust there is. I'm not waiting for them to ask the secret, you know, the question that I just, please ask me that question. I'm just, I'm just being a friend to them and I'm trusting, Lord, if you put me here, the door is going to open. Now, I may open it, but you know, my wife and I spend, we have a, a lot of time, we, we've been a part of this same church for 40 years. Oh, really? What is that church? You know, I kind of heard about that. Really? How so? How did you hear about that? So, it, mm -hmm. it's just like the Lord just, as he takes a flower, it just opens up. 
I'm intentional, but I'm intentional for them to know that I care about them. And then the door for the gospel swings sure. open, even if they don't receive, even if they don't believe. I mean, I've had conversations with guys on the start, they're pantheist, and I don't even remember how they finally surrendered their lives to Christ. I have no idea. But it's like, how did you get from pantheist to follower of Jesus? I mean, I remember when we had lunch together and you said, oh, well, I'm a pantheist. It's like, I don't even know what a pantheist is. What I mean, it's... So, um, but th that's what I found. The aspect of taking, again, if the issue of being intentional, the issue of really caring, making time. Now, I've got, you say, well, I don't have that kind of time. I really do believe we do have the kind of time that God wants us to have. And I don't know what that's, it, it could be on an airplane. It could be somebody on an airplane. I mean, I, I'll just give you my, I'll give you my Muslim um, cab driver, Saeed al-Baldaki. Um, Saeed, I'm just in the, I'm just in the, a cab with him. I mean, it's easy to have conversations with cab drivers. It's easy to have conversations oftentimes with people on a plane next to you. Um, but Saeed is a Muslim, and so I just simply ask the question, um, where are you from? And he tells me he's from, his family's from Pakistan or something like that. And um, how long have you been in the States? Do you have family here? How is it? How's that been? How has it been being a Muslim in a country that's more Christian than it is Muslim? Mm -hmm. Well, how's that been for you? Have you learned much about Christianity? What's, what's your understanding about what Christianity is? And then we just kind of talk a little bit more. I know I don't have much more time in the in the. Cab. I said, would, would, it, would I insult you if I sent you a copy of the New Testament? He says, no. I, would you read it? He said, yes, I would. So he gives me his card. I still have his card. I've got his card over here somewhere. And so I've got his phone number. So I get back to New Orleans. Saeed, what's happening? How are you doing? Hey, did you get a chance to read? Yes, I've read some of that. Um, we talk a little bit later. That's uh, great. You know, Frank, I've been having dreams about Jesus. I'm like, I do not believe this, Lord. So we talked to him. I sent him a copy of uh, um, Nabil Qureshi's Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Great book if you've not had the chance to read it. It's a great book if you have had a chance to read it. Um, sent it to him. Frank, I want you to come over. I want you, when the next time you're in New Orleans, I'm in New York, I want you to come. I want you to come have family, dinner with my family. And but he didn't respond when we got to New York that time. I called him two weeks ago, just felt, I got to call Saeed. Phone wasn't, didn't answer. Then I saw my cell phone, Saeed Abdelbaki. Saeed, no, this is not Saeed. Saeed died two weeks ago of a heart attack. Oh. It's like, oh God. Or last week of a heart attack. And so I just asked a couple of questions. I'm so sorry. And um, no, that's, to the best of my knowledge, the end of the story. Mm -hmm. But there's a New Testament in that house where he lives. Right. There's a copy of Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus in that mm -hmm. house where he lived. Um, and there may be a man named Saeed Abdelbaki in heaven today. Yeah, please, Lord. I don't know. But it doesn't, it's an intentionality that says, you know, if I'm gonna keep my job, I better make five sales a week. I know that's business, and there's a fear of losing your job. But we should be more fearful, I should be, of people going to hell. And, and I should love my father mm -hmm. um, to just, can I get anything out? So when I go on a business trip, I've got, in my little satchel, I've got copies of More Than a Carpenter, I've got copies of uh, a book we used to use. Uh, <laughs> I still quasi, use it. Quasi-heretic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Andy Stanley may not be right in some areas, but the book he wrote, yeah. since nobody's perfect, how good is good enough? Yeah, I still use it. I'm looking for a better one. I'll have copies of, on the arm of my car, at the door of my car, I've got copies of the four spiritual laws, or mm -hmm. how good are you, and I'll give 50 cents, and that, I mean, what, I don't know what God's going to do with that. I'm just a dumb sheep that God says, be obedient. 
Mm -hmm. And so, um, can I say something about the families real quick? Do yeah. you mind if I jump in? Sure. Are you going to say something though? Uh, I don't want to chase okay? off on that. Yep, no, that was excellent. Excellent. So, just one of the things I think it's hardest with is family members. Like, okay, how do you do this? So, when my brother and I first got saved, we were blasting away like a double barreled shotgun with my family, like telling everybody the gospel. And my grandfather was arguing with us. I mean, we were just, you know, there was one point where my grandfather said he hadn't sinned, and I said, well, the Bible says he who says he's without sin is a liar, and there's no truth in him. So, it was just like, you know, people in the family would like Grandpa leave the liar. Room. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, so you know, we did a lot of damage early on, and then you know, so then over the next decade, it's kind of like cleaning up that damage, and then they kind of have to see that you're actually living differently. It's not a fad, that sort of thing. Well, one of the things that can happen is that it, you know you can be a, a great son, a great family member, and never share the gospel. And it could just be like, wow, they're really nice. You know, Keith is just great. His family's, you know, all his kids. And they're just a, an amazing family. Um, I heard this quote once that really affected me by Spurgeon. He said this. If you can rest without their being saved, they will rest too. Like, if you can rest without your family members being saved, they'll rest too. If it's not that big of a deal to you, it's not going to be that big of a deal to them. But then he said, but, and I won't get this exactly right, but he said, but if you, the, the gist of it is, if you are uncomfortable, if you can't stand that they're not saved, if you can't rest, then they will not rest either. In other words, they need to, what he was saying is, they should feel uncomfortable at times. Not all the time. But there should be times where it's, you know, I'll use my mama's example where neither of my parents are divorced, they're not Christians, where, where she says this, why is he, why does he have to talk about this every once? Why is this so important to him? Because she's very uncomfortable. She wants to keep it on the surface. So this is what I would suggest. This is what I do with my family members. Every once in a while, maybe every year to two years, I'll, I'll kind of bring something up. Because I'm, I have two brothers. I'm the favorite son. I talk to my mom all the time. She loves me. I do things for her. I care about the things she cares about. Like, she just thinks I'm a model son. That's not good enough. That's right. Because everything can be nice and happy, and she's headed to hell, right? So you have to, at some point, make this uncomfortable, Right? Jesus was willing to make things uncomfortable. So there was a time uh, several years ago, my grandmother died, and, and so she just said, well, I'll thank God, you know, well, at least grandmama's up there with her dad and the other grandparents and stuff. And I said, okay, I'm going okay, to no, mental note. So I actually, and I found this to be the most effective, is to write a letter. Because if she's talking to me, there's just emotional reaction stuff, but a letter is disconnected and stuff. And I just wrote a long letter where I just said, Mom, thank you. You know, hey, it was, you know, so sorry about the funeral. And I, hey, I remember when you said this about Grandma, that, you know, thank God she's going to be in heaven. Were you assuming that everybody goes to heaven? Because I've actually had conversations with Grandma, and I'm not sure. And so I went into this conversation, and I actually talked about that, and I talked about a conversation that I had with her dad, which I shouldn't have, because that kind of hooked her, the fact that her dad might not be in it. So, you know, I wrote this, like, two-page letter, but the goal of that is to stir it up a little bit. Okay? To... To, so that she can't just be comfortable. So she's in bed at night going, why is this so important to him? What well, is important to him? Because we can't rest, guys. So I know that's hard to do. I have found that like an email or letter can be the most helpful and then you can come back around to it. Or as Frank's saying, say, I was really thinking about you when I read this book and I thought it could be helpful and send it to him. So you have a little distance between yourself and that letter or that book. And then you can find, hey, did you get a chance to read that, Mom? What did you think about what I said? I didn't want to offend you, but this was really important to me. And, I, and you just always put in love. I, I love you so much. And I want you to be with Christ. And she'll be uncomfortable. That's okay. Sometimes. You can't have that every time you're with them. But you need to do that periodically. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. That's good. You know, one of the things I think both of you guys have highlighted is in these common spaces to, to create a, a communication of care. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but I do want to 
I want this to provide genuine help to folks. So the easiest thing you've heard these guys say is get a track, put it in your pocket, and, and have the courage to pull it out and give it to people. Okay, that's the easiest thing you've heard said. Um, as a, as a pastor, let me introduce you to something in you that's getting in the way. You don't seem like you care about people. And here's how I can tell whether you care about somebody. And Frank, I think, said it. And I've been with Jim just long enough to know this guy cares about people. I heard people who rode over in the car with him highlighted this. Um, if you never ask me any questions, I never get the sense that you care about me. All right, so I know this because I'm a people person. I study people. So I can be in a setting. If I'm in a setting with pastors, sometimes, because I'm a question asker, I'm going to ask, I'm going to drown you in questions. By the time we're done, I, I'm going to know everything I can possibly know about you because I want to figure out how to care for you. I'm amazed sometimes that guys, even pastors sometimes, who never, I never hear them ask a question. Mm -hmm. If you don't inquire about people, you don't communicate care. If all you do is tell people things and tell people things and tell people right. things, you care about having an audience. You care about people knowing who you are. But until you'll be quiet and take up their life and be interested in their life, so to spend two and a half years caring for a neighbor, making time to play golf, I'm sure inquiring and asking questions and figuring out who that person is, that communicates care and, and, and that should be sincere. I mean, that should just be sincerely who we are. If, if these folks never respond to the gospel, we don't have this mentality that says, I care about you if you respond to the gospel. Yeah, right. I care about you, period. Right. And my deep prayer for you is that you would respond to the gospel. So let me just ask you this, and you walk away from this conference this week, if you want to move in this direction, do you ask questions when you're with people? Because if you don't, people don't feel your sense of care mm -hmm. when you interact with them. They only feel like you're selling them something. You've got an agenda. Yeah. And we're, we're in their life. These, these common spaces should feature care in them and not just information in them. So I think that's one of the things that makes these guys so effective is they communicate care. Um, all right, let me, let, me, let me get into the philosophy a little bit of, of church, the church world, doing evangelism, um, how many guys were saved before 1990? You saved before 1990. Um, the church world before 1990, I'm just arbitrarily picking that number, but it's, it's probably a good number, created a way of doing discipleship. And it, it featured a, a very clear understanding, a black and white understanding of that which was in the world and that which was in the church. And it, and it drew bold lines. So when you got saved, if you got saved early, uh, before 1990s, you got the idea that you just broke ties with everything that was worldly. And, you know, as a pastor, I love the thought that when the church doors are open, I'm there. And mm -hmm. we learn to live our life within the community of God's people. We learn to speak the language that each other speak. We celebrate the same things. We figured out how to have conversation because that, that, that just got installed. And all along the way, we were just losing our ability to have any form of relating to the lost. And we definitely didn't have time. And we didn't make room for them either. All right, now, if you're, if you're a baby boomer and you got saved early on, that's how you learned Christianity. If you're a millennial and you got saved after the 1990s, uh, you don't draw the same bold lines between the world and the church, which, by the way, drives baby boomers nuts because we don't know what to do with you. We think you're worldly. Um, <laughs> and you live much more in the world of people who are lost. It's just the patterns of your life, right? So, a uh, fellow wrote a book on evangelism named Sam Chan. Uh, he, he's, he will go and do these talks in, in people's houses. He's almost like a traveling philosopher. And so he'll go sit in, and people invite their friends to come, etc. And um, he, he brings this up in the book. He, say, he says, so I, I asked Andrew's wife, because this fellow named Andrew just invites all kinds of people to come to these meetings. And we've got folks like that in Alpha. We've got people in our Alpha course who every time we do Alpha, they can fill a table. 
It's like, haven't you run out of people in your life yet? Nope, got more, and they'll bring a whole table in. Uh, so he says, so I asked Andrew's wife, what was going on? Why was Andrew able to bring so many non-Christian friends to these events? Why were they happy to be there? His wife answered, it's because we're always hanging out together. We're always doing things together. We always go to their things, and they often come to our things. So this is just one of the many things that we do together. If it wasn't this outreach dinner, we'd still be doing something or else with these guys together. All right, so when we give this massive plea to the church to do evangelism, there's a big chunk of the church that has no one to relate to. Mm -hmm. There aren't any friendships there. They are official, formal relationships that we try to stick our head in on. But they're not these shared life type experiences. How do we, how do we manage that? We're building churches that are going to feel a certain way. How do we manage that? that we create lives that can do evangelism, but that can also do church. Because mm -hmm. we're called to be a community yeah. together as well. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, that's a big question too. Um, yeah, so I don't think our danger is doing too much church. I mean, I don't think that our danger is we're going to spend too much time with the lost or build those relationships. Our danger is the other side, that the church is going to consume Christians. We're always around Christians in fellowship and small groups and youth groups and, and that we kind of consume our lives. That's more of our danger. So I, That's how the evangelist, by the way, answers that question. Yeah. The pastor who doesn't see you very often in your small groups answers it different than what he just said. He thinks you're hanging out with your worldly friends too much. But go ahead, Jim. And we're still praying for you, Keith. Yeah. We're still praying for you. <laughs> Jim, yeah, could so, you get up here and help me? Can I get a pastor up here to help? He's an evangelist. So, yeah, I think, I think that finding ways to build those relationships is one of the hardest things. And so I read a book. It was, it was really good. It's called The Art of Neighboring. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, who do I start with? And it's like, well, how about your actual neighbors? Um, God's placed you there for a reason. Like, well, who is my neighbor? How about the person that lives next door to you? And so, part of that, it's again, it can be hard to do that, like to break the ice and build those relationships. But the whole book is basically about just having your neighbors over, doing a block party, having a barbecue. Uh, we did this years ago um, with our neighborhood. We just went around and had a little flyer and went to eight of our neighbors and seven of them came and they thought it was the most amazing thing ever that we initiated this and uh, it, it, you know it, we're, Christians are used to these kinds of things like we have hospitality we have people in our homes this is foreign for people and so this is not easy but you have to make a concerted effort to say we're going to get to know our neighbors. We're going to invite someone over for a barbecue. We're going to invite somebody over for dinner. We're going to invite somebody over for a game. And just break the ice and begin to build that relationship. If we can do that, if, if, that, if you can do that one thing, and then at work, this is what I would say. Figure out who that person is, maybe that's friendly or somebody you talk to, and just say, hey, do you want to go to lunch on Friday? And just start lunches on Friday and just start saying, hey, why don't we go out? And you don't have to have any agenda. Just get to know them, spend time with them. Somebody else says, hey, we're going out to lunch Friday. You want to join us? And just, if you can begin to build those relationships, stuff is going to happen. I, I believe it's just a matter of us taking the time. And that's the hardest thing for us. To that you guys are great at relationships. You're fun. You're funny. You're hospitable. You're generous. You're, you guys got this. And you know the gospel. The gospel is in you guys. And so it's just again. How do we get these two circles together? So I think about who God has placed in your life. Those around you, your neighbors, unsaved family members, co-workers, those are the people that God wants us to befriend. And if we can do that, stuff's going to happen. Um, it really is that simple. I, I, know, I don't know why we make it so hard. Is that If I think that God has intentionally placed me at 252 Sharon Drive, I work at 110 Veterans Boulevard, a five-story building, I exercise at Heritage Fitness Center, um, and I frequent a place called Pacino's Coffee Shop. My, it's really funny because I spent so much time at this local coffee shop that over the course of, I think, the last three years, 
my office staff as a Christmas gift has given me like a thousand dollar gift card to Pacino's. I don't know if they like that I'm not in the office or they're just trying to <laughs> offset some of the cost. But it's, it's so exciting, it really is, to think, Lord, you, you placed me here strategically. This was mm -hmm. not just because the house was just like my wife wanted it to be or the neighborhood looked good. Yeah, that's all true, and that's great. That's just compounded grace of God. But you placed me here mm -hmm. to declare your praises, however you would do that. So at my office, at, I mean, I could just tell you story after story at, at, of this at the little heritage fitness center of stories and people that have come to Alpha. And I mean, is Lloyd in here? No, he's not. That jerk. Um, so, <laughs> My, are my boys in here? My sons and my son-in-law. Sam, is that you back there? At least my son-in-law is here. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Don't worry, I'm remembering that in the will. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Um, but uh, it, if my first thought can become, and, and again, it's, I think it's a matter of prayer. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers mm -hmm. into his harvest field. When you pray that prayer, just set a mirror in front of you. Because we are the answer to that mm -hmm. prayer. Mm -hmm. Lord, send Jim. Send Keith. Send Ray. Send Joe. Uh, no, no, no. I, th I think, how many of us pray that prayer? I mean, it's it crazy. It's, it's right there. The Lord said, pray the mm -hmm. Lord of the harvest to send. <laughs> how do you want me to pray, Lord? Uh, have you read Matthew 9 lately? Luke 10. Pray the Lord of the harvest that sent forth laborers and harvest. The laborers are, what? The, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I'm not going to be not one of those few. And so I, I really believe it's, you know, whether we talk about the antenna or whatever, it's, if the Spirit of God lives in me, and He does, and he lives in you, and he does. We have received power. Mm -hmm. Because the Holy Spirit has come upon us to do what? To be my witnesses. I mean, that's... I got that scripture memorized. Mm -hmm. I don't live it very well, but I got that thing memorized. I have received. I don't have to say you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. I have received power mm -hmm. because the Holy Spirit has come upon me for this purpose. Amen. To be a walking, talking, living, breathing billboard of the only name that has been given to men whereby they must be saved. Yep, amen. Whether God saves them or not, that's his deal. Whether I go to them or not, that's my deal. Yeah, let, me, all right, let me ask one more question. Uh, we're going to go back as churches. Pastors are going to go back and seek to invigorate this in, into our setting. A lot of what you guys have shared would highlight uh, the activity of individual evangelism. Uh, but there's a dimension of evangelism that is community bound. Mm -hmm. It's connected to the church. And so yeah. we do corporate evangelism. Um, variety of settings that we have for corporate activity. So Sunday mornings are a setting where our churches mm -hmm. gather. Our small groups are a setting where believers are gathered. Uh, we use Alpha. You guys do the bridge course where we gather people yeah. into this setting. Uh, and, and one of the things, may not be the only thing we're doing in those settings, but one of the things is evangelism that we're doing in that setting. We're not always featuring that. Maybe Sunday morning doesn't feature that in certain ways. Mm -hmm. But individually, we are also corporately connected. So mm -hmm. how can we make the best use of that partnership mm -hmm. between the corporate church that does evangelism and the individual mm -hmm. who's seeking to yeah, evangelize. I'm actually going to talk about that tomorrow, especially the corporate, uh, the impact of Sunday mornings evangelistically. So that's part of my message in Acts that I'll talk about. But the, the one thing I'll say just about this is that our corporate witness is really important. So do you know what I mean by corporate witness? It's, it's when we're gathered together as a body, we are testifying together to the power of the gospel. So, for instance, let's say Keith is reaching out to his neighbor. Well, his neighbor can always just write him off. He's just a good guy. You know, he's just, I don't know, he comes from good stock. 
you know, he drinks good water, whatever. He just, he just has nice kids, I don't know. So, but they can write Keith off as an exception. When they come to church and they see a group of people that are like Keith and whose lives have been transformed and are full of joy and they see young people worshiping the Lord, well, they have to sit up and take notice. They can't write it off anymore. That's the effect of corporate witness. We see it in, in the Bridge course. That's our alpha all the time. So when people come to Bridge, some of them don't care about the message, but they see all these people who are serving them, and they see the way that we love one another, the relationships that we have, like the leaders in the groups, and they see our love for each other, and they say, hmm, Something's different about this place. They may not care about the message that's being said, but that corporate witness gets their attention. So that's why it's helpful to not just be kind of like one-on-one, as Keith is saying, but to see them in these settings where there are other Christians around so that they can say, they can't just write you off as the exception. So I'll talk more about that tomorrow on Sunday morning, but I think that corporate witness is very important. You'll hear even in some evangelism books that idea of belonging before believing which means you've got to get them into things. Let them see the church. Get them into the church. Get them into small groups. Get them into things. I don't always think that's necessary. I don't think your small groups have to be evangelistic. Unless there's lots of unbelievers coming, then I think your small groups should be evangelistic. But if it's not, I, I think, though, getting non-Christians around Christians is really important, and God can use that. And I've seen God use that to, to change people's lives and get them to, to listen to the gospel, and God saves them. So... You know, just the, when you ask that question, it just pops into my brain is, is John 17. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is toward the end of the, the chapter in the 22nd verse. It says, In the glory, Jesus praying to his Father, the glory which you've given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. Because so we get this corporate statement that Jesus has given him, that they may be perfected in unity. Why? And this is what Jesus tells us, that the world may know that you did send me and did love them even as you love me. So there's this amazing element of unity. Now I, I think of Genesis 11, the Lord comes down, Babel is happening, Let's look, what they're, look and see what they're doing. And, and, and the Lord says this because if they're successful in doing what they're doing, do you remember what the scripture says? Nothing will be impossible for them. I'm going, nothing will be impossible for them. As the unbeliever comes together in unity, building some stupid, futile effort to take over heaven or what they're trying to do. But I was thinking, if for the unbeliever, nothing would be impossible in that setting, what? could happen yeah, that's a good point. in the community of believers sharing the word so that the world would know that you did send me and love them mm -hmm. Father even in the same way just as you love me that, what excites me so much about Alpha is I see that verse being on yeah. display I see the Lord Jesus' conversation with his Father right before he goes to the cross. That conversation, that prayer, that communication being answered in the community of believers as we come together with gifts of hospitality, as we come together with gifts of washing dishes, as we come together with serving gifts of all types. And, and we see that unity on display. I believe the power of the gospel that and the fruit of what we see at Lakeview through the Alpha Course is the unity of believers, the power of the unity of believers. And so um, that's, that's uh, just to get much more excited than that. All right, guys, so I'm gonna, I am going to leave just a couple of minutes here for questions. So if you guys had thought about a question, you want to come up to the microphone right there and, and ask it. Um, we're going to take about... 10 minutes or so before we run out of time to, to do that. So, Charlie, you can come up and ask it if you want. 
uh, I know this is a little bit off the subject here, but uh, some years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I'd read uh, a comment by a Christian. He says, since World War II, had we successfully evangelized our own children, we would be in the majority today. Okay. Uh, I have a friend who's about my age. We both worked at plants. Same number of kids, same everything. He was a leader, an elder in the church. I'm trying to figure out how my kids all got saved in spite of me. Mm -hmm. And I look at this guy and every one of his kids is as lost as pate as duck. I'm telling you. And I don't understand. You know what I'm saying? Wait, as lost as a what? I, I got lost on that, sorry. He's, he's from South Louisiana. Patez Duck. <laughs> Patez lost his duck, okay? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, <laughs> so, is that that lake? Is that the lake that's above New Orleans? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the point being... Okay, okay, oh, so, okay, sorry. How do we successfully evangelize, you know... You know, I wonder, how did my kids get saved? And this guy, who I looked up to as a leader, as an elder, mm -hmm. and other people did too, and yet he lost every one of his kids. Oh. What is the key to all this? What, what, is there a secret to, to raising your kids to serve Jesus Christ? Mm. I, I have no idea. I think it's the grace of God. No. It's the grace of God on your life. I think that one of the, one of the keys to parenting is to show people to show your children your love for Jesus that you treasure him more than anything if your parenting is a series of rules um, and and laws as to what they can and can't do they're going to just bide their time until they can break free it's like you know, you put a, a chain link fence around them. They're pressing their face against a chain link. I want to get to what's out there. But what you need to do is show them that what's inside that fence, Jesus, is more valuable than anything in this world. If you treasure Christ, if you love him, and you focus your life on how much he loves you, and you will love him back in return, your kids will see that Jesus is the most valuable thing in this world and they won't have the chain link marks on their face saying how can I get out to what is out there so I don't know I mean and it's it's all grace you got to be on your knees and praying and fasting and asking God to save those kids and protect them the world is strong the devil is the devil is good at what he does and we need to be on our knees and just praying for him. I don't know. I mean, that's a, it's a great question. Keith, that's a pastoral question. Keith, why don't you take that? <laughs> no. Yeah, that's, that is a, that's a hard question. I, I do, and there is no, I, I don't know if you can draw any equal signs to mm -hmm. when this guy did this, look, and then somebody else does it, and you look, and it's yeah. different. I, I think that's just part of the story of humanity that, that sits in the mind of God and makes sense and doesn't for us because we just don't have all the information. I would say this, I think one of the things that is a, a dangerous thing, and, and this doesn't guarantee your kids are going to be converted, but there is, a, there is a genuineness to encountering God that it smells a certain way. It is a certain way. And that's not always, I mean, I just had this conversation with some guys in one of our churches in our region. I think one of the things that I found attractive about Sovereign Grace churches was the genuineness of the people. That there wasn't, there wasn't this form there was, there was humility, there was reality, they had warts, people talked about the realities of what they weren't. Uh, there wasn't like, we've all got to play, and we've all got to have the script going on. See, that works when you come together for about two hours a week. But you live with your family, man. Mm -hmm. That don't work at home. They see through that in a second, and your version of Christianity stinks to them. So I think genuine humility, walking in a real way, yeah. being parents who when you... And, I mean, my kids know I, I was worse than they were as a teenager. They know that. So when I approach them in their issues, they already know, at least I'm better than you, Dad. Uh, 
Because I would have featured that in them. I would have been understanding as to why you screwed up just now. Because I get that. I screwed up worse than you did. And to be able to address it from from a, a human standpoint. So I think there is a dimension in our churches too. The community that we have for our churches. I think the churches that do evangelism well are where people are real and there's genuineness there. The ones who have a form of the brother and sister thing going on. I don't find they do evangelism very well. They just, they're just a community unto themselves. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if that answers the question. I think there's a lot of mystery in what you yeah. asked, Charlie. Um, can I just ask, how many of you are raising or rearing children today? Okay. Well, that's a really appropriate question. Then. Um, nobody knows the hypocrite that you are like your children do. They're, we are on full display. And so we are also on full display to show them really who Jesus is. When we confess, yeah. Dad just blew it. Yeah. So um, one of the things that um, we can only, I could say, as fathers, we can only be responsible for that which we're responsible for. And their salvation does not come in that checklist. Um, I remember James Dobson said once, I've heard this 40 years ago, probably close to 40 years ago. He says, the greatest teaching or the greatest gift you can ever give your children is to love their mother. And that stuck with me. Because what's marriage supposed to be? A picture of Christ in his church. And so that public displays of affection which the kids always, when they were smaller, tried to wheedle their way between Annette mm-hmm. and me, and it's just so great. Um, praying with them before night, sharing with them the testimonies of what God has done. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the greatest testimonies, I don't know if Dave and Paul remember this, but praying with them when I was a Wednesday night, and just as we prayed every night, one of the things I would pray, I'd pray Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 over them every night. Um, but we were praying for our family. That night I'm praying for my my. My, na- uh, my grandfather, my dad's father, um, for whom I was named, Frank. And um, man, that night, the power of God came upon the three of us as we're praying. Now, David's seven, Paul's five. And the next morning, I have a breakfast meeting. And I am, uh, the guy doesn't show up. So I drive to his house. He's still there. He's still at home, sleeping it off. And I said, look. Not sleeping it off like he was drunk the night before, but he was. Uh, and I said, and I remember the words I said. I said, Lord, what does wisdom say that I do? And I heard the Lord say, I thought it was the Lord said, you go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital because my 90-year-old grandfather had just had surgery, hip surgery. The doctor said, your grandfather's got the heartbeat of a, six, a healthy 60-year-old man. I said, that's great. But what we had prayed that Wednesday night is that God, we bind death. Yeah, but I don't know if this is theologically correct or not, but we it's bound not, death. We're going to have a session, on, okay. have a session yeah. on that after Just that. go with yeah. the crank. Yeah. <laughs> you're an evangelist. You're, yeah. Your doctor yeah. so, can I mean, stay. Yeah, evangelists can do anything they want. So we, I mean, we just pray, Lord, don't let him die before he comes to know Jesus. That's better, yeah. <laughs> I, I've only been an elder for like not even a year, so... <laughs> So we wrestled death to the ground and we cast... Um, is that okay? Uh, so, um, Frank, you don't have power over death. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. So anyway, uh, so I go, up to the, I go up to the hospital room where my grandfather, who had his teeth removed at that time, his dentures weren't in, uh, but he had his arms strapped to the side of the bed because he kept pulling the catheter out. And... Um, he was a doctor and he delivered most of the Italians in the city of New Orleans at that time. And uh, so I talked to him. I was like, Lord, what do I tell this man? And uh, he said, talk to him about a family reunion. And I said, that's brilliant. Because what Italian patriarch doesn't want to talk about a family reunion? And I talked to him about a family reunion that there was going to be in heaven. And I wanted him to be there. And with me that morning, he confessed Christ and surrendered his life to Christ. That's great. Thank you. And I just prayed that prayer with the, the kids the night before. It was a Thursday morning. I went to uh, be with my grandfather. And uh, I got to go home and tell my kids, 
David, Paul, you bound death and death. <laughs> are they, write a book. Are any of them here now? Can we, are they here now? Can we talk yeah, we'll to them this? We'll straighten it out. <laughs> so they got to be in on that. And do you know what happened 48 hours later? Their grandfather died. Completely as a shock to all the medical professionals. But what had happened to him was that night, my uncle, another doctor, went to his bedside and he noticed, and he told me this later, my uncle did, he was, he's the, he was the librarian to me, my uncle. And uh, he said, I went to your grandfather's uh, uh, hospital room and he had such an eerie peace about him like I'd never seen before. And he said, and my uncle said to his father, you're not going to go and die on me, are you, damn it? I mean, tell me exactly, I remember those words. Is that okay that I said that? Yeah. Okay. So it's a quote. I'm in real trouble here. Um, <laughs> Your eldership may be coming to a premature end is what I'm sensing, Frank, but, but keep going. <laughs> no, that's right. No. That's what he does. <laughs> And then I, it gave me the opportunity to open the door to share with my uncle what had taken place. And so I think we, if, if our kids see Christianity as real and we share with them not just our failures but our successes, we include them as much as we can, there's no guarantees. I don't know why my three children love the Lord. I don't know why they marry Christians. I don't know why they still go to church with us. I don't know any of that stuff. All I can do is thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And, uh, and then look at the man who's struggling and pray with him and, con and comfort him and see if there are ways that you can be a part of. Maybe get, they're still alive. They're still on the planet. So, Well, guys, uh, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I think this weekend is a bit of a teaser into a much bigger category. I do want to encourage you as you go back to your um, churches and consider, I think that this is just a reality for the church and for the average Christian to step it up in evangelism is going to mean we, we probably just can't keep doing the same things we've been doing. So if, if you walk away from this weekend and we just go back and just let's just keep doing what we're doing, I, I don't think our churches will become greater corporate places of evangelism. I don't in, think individually we'll be much different in our evangelistic efforts as well. And, and it is an enormous value. It, it is to be something that we cherish, make room for, and prioritize as local churches and as members of local churches. So uh, I know that did, like if we opened up the questions, there'd be a gazillion. Take those questions back and, and wrestle with them and, and, and be careful as you wrestle with them. Uh, there are forms of things that we do that we treat sacred. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tweak this one out. I'll leave it to the pastors to solve this. But um, the history of our use of small groups, for instance, as a movement of churches has primarily been about sanctification. And so... Uh, it has been maybe an unspoken thought that small groups are for believers. Small groups are where believers work out their sanctification. And so you, you don't use that evangelistically. And that would be probably how most of us use small groups. And I wouldn't say that's wrong to do that. But I wouldn't say it's wrong to be thinking, hey... I wonder if we could do evangelism through a small group setting. I think you need to figure out how to do evangelism through every possible setting you can create. And quite honestly, I don't think it violates something in scripture if you were to say, hey, you know, most of our small groups are going to be doing the sanctification and believers confessing and walking out together, etc. But, but we're going to have some groups available to create some overlap between our lives and the lives of those who are lost that are in our world. And we're going to strategically use those uh, for the sake of evangelism. And I say that to you because if you, if you run back from here to your church, uh, most of the churches in our region, um, I, smaller churches don't tend to get a lot of traction out of Alpha I'm not sure how the bridge course does. Um, 
And I would have loved to ask you guys some, some thoughts on that. But that can be tough in a smaller setting. And so if the only thing you hear is, well, the only thing available for us to do corporate evangelism is, is that kind of a bridge or alpha course, and you take it back, it, it doesn't have the energy and the largeness and the feel for it. it sometimes it doesn't self-perpetuate well. And so you did it once, you tried it again, and it fizzled out. You may have to find other ways to do evangelism that work for you that work for the church that's your size with the gifts that you have and the people that you have involved. But you have got to find a way to do that. So in the same way that, that these guys are encouraging us individually, I want to encourage us pastorally that these corporate settings that we create need to include a priority for evangelism. And we need to just do everything we can to figure out how that's going to work moving forward. But thank you guys. Um, I think there's